Um, today we would uh, we are very pleased, the privilege to uh, uh, host uh, once again Dr. Mujan Momen, who is a, a private and independent scholar. Um, Dr. Momen uh, was born in Iran, but uh, raised in and educated in England, uh, in the uh, and uh, attended the University of Cambridge. Is a medical doctor and has a special interest in the study of the Baha'i faith and Shi'i Islam, both from the viewpoint of their history and their doctrines. In recent years, his interest has extended to the study of the phenomena of religion. His principal publication in the field include Introduction to Shi'i Islam, The Babi and Baha'i Faith, 1844 to 1944, some contemporary Western accounts. Uh, the Phenomena of Religion, the Baha'i Affairs, a short introduction, selection from the writings of E.G. Brown on the Babi and Baha'i religions, Buddhism and the Baha'i and the Baha'i faith, studies in Babi and Baha'i history. Uh, he also wrote uh, and contributed articles to uh, Encyclopedia Iranica, a distinguished uh, Encyclopedia Iranica, uh, Encyclopedia of the Modern Islamic World, uh, as well as papers to academic journals such as the International Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, Past and Present, Iran, and Religion. He is also fellow and member of uh, the Royal Asiatic Society, the British Society for Middle Eastern Studies, the Society of Iranian Studies, the British Association for the Study of Religion, and the Association for Baha'i Studies. Uh, today's uh, lecture will uh, deal with the attempted assassination of uh, Nasser Din Shah in 1852, millennialism and violence. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Good. Um, the topic of millennialism and violence has come very much to the fore uh, in the aftermath of a number of episodes that occurred particularly right at the end of the 20th century uh, leading up to the uh, second Christian millennium. There were episodes such as the uh, Waco uh, tragedy in 1993, the two sets of deaths associated with the Solar Temple in Switzerland and Canada in 1994 and 1995, um, Om Shinriko's release of sarin gas in the town of Matsumoto in 1994 and on the Tokyo underground in 1995 and the Heaven's Gate group suicides in 1997. These events concentrated the minds of many scholars on the propensity for some millennialist groups to turn to violence and in this paper what I want to do is to look at uh, a number uh, of uh, at the events that caused a 19th century group in Iran to also uh, commit an act of violence which was the attempted assassination of Nasir Din Shah in 1852. This was an uh, attempt carried out by the Barbies, the followers of the Bab, uh, uh, religion that began in the 19th century and uh, began in 1844 to be precise, started by Sayyid Ali Muhammad Shirazi who took the title of the Bab and the movement became known as the Babi movement and its connection with the Baha'i faith uh, which is the series that this talk is being presented in is that uh, the Bab uh, is regarded together with Baha'u'llah as the co-founders of the Baha'i faith and in a period of some six years from 1844 to 1850 uh, when the, uh, the Bab was executed in 1850. In that period of time, the Babi movement caused quite a stir in Iran. It was considered um, challenging, both from the religious point of view, in that the Bab put forward certain claims. He claimed to be the fulfillment of Shi'i prophecies related to the coming of the, uh, the arising of the 12th Imam, the return of the 12th Imam, um, uh, the Imam Mahdi, uh, he, so he put forward certain religious claims and these were simultaneously in a sense also political claims because the Imam had both religious and political authority and therefore by putting forward this claim he was making both a religious and a political claim. 
at least that's how it seemed to the to the people who heard this claim. And um, so consequently, the, uh, the whole movement caused a great deal of turmoil in Iran. Um, initially, the turmoil was mainly in terms of polemic. The Iranian religious leaders in Iran, the Muslim religious leaders in Iran, uh, condemned the new movement and, and started to uh, preach against it. And initially, again, the, the uh, opposition from the government was merely co confining the Bab and preventing him from having free access to his followers, for example. But the Babi movement, despite this, continued to spread, and at its peak it may have had as, as many as 100,000 followers in Iran, which may have represented, I mean, all these figures are very vague, nobody knows what the population of Iran was at that time, but it may have been as much as 2 or 3 percent of the population of Iran. But um, what happened, so this was 18, I've put some key dates up on there to help us along. Uh, 1844 was the start of the Barbie movement, and four years later in 1848, there was a marked change in um, the uh, response of the government to the Barb. The previous Shah, the previous king, Muhammad Shah, died in that year, and a new uh, ruler, Nasser Din Shah, came to the throne. And he and his new and the new prime minister, in particular Mirza Taghi Khan, who took the title Amir Kabir or Amir Nizam, um, they they were very much more active in in opposing the Bab. And the new prime minister Mirza uh, Taghi Khan took advantage of a what might have been considered a, a local altercation between some of the Barbies and a local religious leader in Mazandaran to confront the new movement and he sent royal troops up uh, to support the local people in their opposition to the Barbies and he sent thousands of in fact troops and ba uh, batteries of artillery against a handful of uh, people and they were no more than three or four hundred Barbies collected in Mazandaran and they were mostly students and merchants and tradespeople um, and he sent thousands of royal troops against them and batteries of artillery and so on and uh, the first of the episodes uh, that I put up there, Sheikh Tabarsi, was this episode in Mazandaran um, which resulted in the death of um, several hundred Barbies um, and this was followed um, in 1850 by two further episodes in Nairiz and Mazandaran uh, uh, sorry, Nairiz and, and Zanjan, Nairiz being in the south of Iran and Zanjan being in the north west on the ro main road between Tehran and Tabriz um, and again in both of these two episodes uh, thousands of royal troops uh, together with artillery were sent against the Barbies resulting eventually in the um, death of many, uh, a, a, a general massacre of the Barbies and, and, and the death of many hundreds of them. And in 1850, uh, the Barb himself was uh, executed by, um, by the uh, orders of the Shah and of the Prime Minister. And um, so that's the, the background, if you like, to this episode that we're going to be talking about, which has occurred in 1852, so two years after the execution of the Barb. Um, now, although the Barbie movement has been uh, compared by at least one scholar to the Taiping movement in China, um, this doesn't seem to me a valid comparison because the Taiping movement in China, the founder of that movement, um, whose name I think is pronounced as Hong Xu Quan, um, was clearly intended a, a, a worldly kingdom. He clearly intended to oppose the uh, Manchu dynasty and to overthrow the Confucian system. And a, mi a military conflict was on the cards right from the start because of, of what he was planning and what he's laid out as his plans. Whereas the Bab, in contrast, addressed letters to the Shah, uh, to Muhammad Shah, who, who was reigning when he first uh, started his um, mission in the early years of his ministry. He 
sent letters to him in a respectful tone and stressed that his desire was for Muhammad Shah to investigate and to champion the cause of the Bab. And um, even after Muhammad Shah, influenced by the then Prime Minister, had refused to meet the Bab and had imprisoned him in a remote corner of Iran, the Bab still never called on his followers to rise up against the Shah or to uh, cause any, um, the Bab in his writings never called upon his followers to make any sort of opposition to the regime in Iran. And um, so what, what we're going to talk about is what happened, so during the time of the Bab, as I say, although there were these conflicts, uh, there was no sense uh, in which the Barbies were rising up against the government, that these were mainly local conflicts that were then blown up into a, a major thing by the royal troops being sent against the Barbies, and the Barbies were, for the most part, defending themselves in these episodes. So up to 1850, there had been no episode, there had not really been any opposition from the Barbies to the movement, the Barbies were not trying to over overthrow the government, and certainly the Barb himself in his writings was not trying to do anything um, like that. So what we're going to consider in this paper is really what happened to turn this situation uh, around so that in 1852 there was an attempt on the life of the Shah by the Barbies, a, a very direct confrontation, if you like. The topic of uh, millennialism and violence is one that, as I say, has uh, attracted a lot of attention and there have been quite a few scholars now who have written on that subject. Um, millennialism can be defined and has been defined by one leading scholar as being uh, those who, millennialists are those who believe in a salvation that is collective this worldly, imminent, total in the sense that it is to utterly transform life on earth, and miraculous in the sense that it is to be brought about by a supernatural means. And in Shi Islam, this millennialist um, uh, fervor is kept very much alive and in the forefront of people's minds the whole time, because every year you have commemorations of the defeat and uh, martyrdom of the Shi'i Imams. These were 12, 11 figures who in the years immediately after the Prophet Muhammad were the descendants of Muhammad and whom Shi'is regard to have been the rightful rulers in Islam, but who whose position was, according to the Shi'is, usurped by the caliphs, the Umayyad and later the Abbasid caliphs. And um, so therefore, in the eyes of Shi'is, these people were wronged, their position was usurped, and they were all martyred. And in particular, the third Shi'i Imam Hussein's uh, death is commemorated every year in the uh, first 10 days of Muharram, uh, the first month of the Islamic year. Uh, you have very major commemorations, recitals of the sufferings of the Imams, uh, theatrical performances, commemorating his death, and um, processions where people wail and beat themselves and whip themselves and so on. And these are very, very major part of Shi'i life because it's not just those 10 days. All through the year there's other, the commemorations of the martyrdom of other Imams. So continuously this is being brought to the minds of the Shi'is and at the same time as these deaths are being commemorated in the what is being reinforced is the idea that eventually the 12th Imam will return and right these wrongs. So it's, in one sense, uh, a looking back, these commemorations are looking back at the past, but at the same time they are reinforcing this millennialist idea, this millennialist fervor that at some stage these, right, these wrongs that have been done in the, wrong, in the past will be righted by the coming of the Imam Mahdi and the um, uh, the, the fact that he will defeat the enemies of the Shi'is and overturn these wrongs that have been done. So, in Shi'ism, you, you have this sort of ever-present uh, idea and, and being strongly reinforced all the time about this coming of the uh, Imam who will, who will fight a battle against the enemies of the Shi'is, defeat them, and put everything right that was put wrong in the past. 
Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, scholars in this field of millennialism has divided, has described two types of millennialism, which I've put up there. The catastrophic millennialism, which anticipates a sudden and usually violent overthrow of the present order by a supernatural agency, which is usually God. So in other words, that the, there will be a sudden and violent overturning of the order. Um, usually there is a, a messianic element to it in the sense that some figure will arise who will do this. Um, and you can find this sort of millennialism in Christianity, in Judaism, in, in Islam, and even in uh, Buddhism. Um, and the other type of millennialism is the what she calls, uh, Catherine Wessinger calls the uh, progressive type of millennialism, which looks to a gradual improvement in human circumstances, carried out by generally by human beings, even though it may be under the guidance of a superhuman agency, but basically a gradual change. So you have the catastrophic millennialism, which is a violent, sudden change and overthrow, and a progressive millennialism, which is a gradual improvement in human circumstances. And if in this, ca in this classification, she, Islam, clearly falls into the catastrophic variety in that the coming of the 12th Imam will bring about an ap apocalyptic battle in which the forces of the Imams, the forces of good, will be ranged against the forces of evil, and they will be defeated, and the earth will be filled with justice by the um, triumph of the Imam. So, as I say, Shi'i Islam clearly falls into this catastrophic uh, um, description that Catherine Wessinger has given. But what we find in the writings of the Bab is that he was trying to shift his followers away from this catastrophic millennialism into, into more the <coughs> progressive type. <clears throat> in his uh, writings, you find that he is interpreting all of these apocalyptic events that will occur in spiritual and metaphoric terms. He talks about <clears throat> the resurrection of the dead being a spiritual resurrection. He talks about spiritual victory rather than um, uh, uh, physical victory and so on. And he is trying to, in his writings, to get his followers to... Uh, follow ethical values. He talks about the setting up of a Barbie state. His idea is that there will be, it will be through the agency of the Barbies that the world will be transformed. So he's moving the Barbies who come from this Shi'i cultural background away from this catastrophic view into this more progressive view. But um, the problems the problem is that the Barb's message has difficulty in diffusing through to its followers. Or followers. Although there was this very rapid expansion of the numbers of the Barbies, it's fairly clear that the actual teachings of the Barb diffuse through to its followers very much with a great deal more difficulty. Firstly, because the Barb himself was confined right from the start of his ministry. He was confined to one extent or another when he was in Shiraz, when he was in Esfahan, and more particularly towards the end of his ministry when he was imprisoned in Marku and, and Chehrik. He was in prison. There, there were guards to actually prevent his followers from getting in. And so whatever he was writing and the, the message he was trying to get across had a great deal of difficulty getting through to his followers. And his writings were in Arabic and his followers were, uh, were for a large part in Arabic and his followers were Iranians, most of whom didn't read the Arabic. And so, although the Bab, as I say, was trying to make this movement, um, we, we can be fairly sure that the vast majority of his followers remained culturally rooted in their Shi'i background of a sort of vision of a, a, a sort of catastrophic type of millennialism. Um, so, what uh, I've already described the fact that the Barbies had these series of defeats in 18, between 1848 and 1850 at uh, Sheikh Tabarsi and Nairiz and Zanjan. And then the Bab himself was executed in 1850. And if we now look to how the Barbies saw themselves in, say, late 1850, at the end of all of this, <clears throat> there's no doubt that the Barbies 
saw these defeats, saw the events, particularly at Sheikh Tabarsi, as being, in a sense, reenactments of the uh, events of the past. In other words, that the defeats that they had um, suffered were, to a certain extent, seen as reenactments of the episode of Karbala when the Imam uh, Hussein had been uh, martyred, and uh, so they saw their own defeats as being reenactments of these episodes. Um, I'm going to read out for you the words which have been put into the mouth of a one of the military leaders of the royal forces um, who uh, was sent against the Barbies at Sheikh Tabarsi, a, one of the Barbi Baha'i historians, puts the following words into the mouth of the military leader of the forces set, sent against the Barbies. Uh, reflecting on the episode afterwards, he says, truth of the matter is that anyone who had not seen Karbala, which is where the Imam Hussein was martyred, anyone who had not seen Karbala would, if he had seen Tabarsi, not only comprehended what took place there, but would have ceased to regard Karbala at all. And had he seen Mullah Hussein, who was the Barbi leader at um, Sheikh Tabarsi, he would have been convinced that the chief of martyrs, the Imam Hussein, had returned to earth. And had, and had he witnessed my deeds, in other words, he himself, the leader of the forces against the Barbies, had he seen my deeds, he would assuredly have said, this is Shem, who was the killer of the Imam Hussein, come back with sword and lance. And this quotation points to a very important doctrinal feature in all of this, which is that the Bab very much, very strongly in his writings and in his doctrine, reinforced this idea of return, that the people who enacted these dramas in the time of the Bab were the return of the people who in the previous age had been the Imam Hussein and his followers on one side, and Yazid, the Umayyad Caliph, and Shem, the killer of the Imam Hussein, on the other side. So it was very much, an, uh, um, spiritually speaking, an uh, enactment of the previous episode, and these people were the return of those previous people who had fought on the two sides. So this this sort of doctrinal element reinforced, if you like, this feeling that th these were apocalyptic battles being fought. And so it wasn't just that the Shah was being compared to Yazid, he actually was the return of Yazid, if you like. It wasn't just that um, uh, the Barbies, um, he was the return of Yazid who had ordered the death of the Bab and the people who had carried out his orders were Shemr, who had carried out the killing of the Imam Hussein. And this, of course, then stirred up within the followers of the Bab all of these feelings that they had about these episodes at Karbala and years of, of cultural um, indoctrination, you might say, of, of the evils of the people who had fought against the Imam Hussein and how it was the duty of everyone to fight against these people and so on. So looking at you know, what the position was of the Barbi movement at the end of 1850 after the execution of the Bab and at the end of these episodes of uh, where they'd been defeated, we can see that they had this very strong feeling that they were part of this thing, that the first phase had ended in defeat, but that didn't necessarily mean complete defeat because there was other figures expected, uh, as well as the return of the Imam uh, Mahdi, the, 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 um, uh, the twelfth Imam. It was expected that all of the other Imams would also return. There would be a return of the Imam Hussein. There would be the coming of, of the return of Jesus Christ. Um, all of these figures would return. And so it wasn't, uh, there was this expectation that this battle, if you like, would carry on until eventual victory. Um, the execution of the Bab himself undoubtedly removed one of the major restraining forces on the Barbies because, as I say, the Bab himself had always written in such a way as to minimize these um, violent tendencies, if you like. He had himself refrained from any provocative statements in his writings that might be considered in any way to promote violence. and. Um, uh, he had never, for example, called for a jihad or anything like that, which he, although in his writings he had allowed for jihad, 
he had never himself called for that, which he could easily have done after, say, the Sheikh Tabarsi episode. Uh, he had never um, uh, promoted any of this, and with his removal, with his execution, uh, and with the removal at these episodes of Sheikh Tabasi in particular, but also Zanjan and Nairiz of the top echelon of the Barbi movement, the people who thoroughly understood what the Barb, if you like, was trying to say, you had uh, a situation in which the Barbies were cast adrift, uh, the top layer of leadership had been removed, and they were back, sort of cast back on their own resources which tended, as I say, to have this very uh, apocalyptic um, ideas from their Shi'i background about what was happening, about the uh, w w what they were involved with uh, was a, 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 an apocalyptic um, battle against the forces of evil. Okay, so what I want to do then is to now concentrate on what was happening in Tehran, because this episode that happened in, eight, in 15th of August, 1852, um, the attempt on the life of Nasser al-Din Shah was very much something that happened among the Tehran Barbies. Uh, and this numbered, the, the Tehran Barbies, as far as I can make out, probably numbered, say, between 200 and 300 people. Um, and it was very much something that happened among this group of Barbies. Now, the vast, so in other words, the vast majority of Barbies were not involved in this. This was uh, a small number of Barbies, and as, I, as I'll come on to show, it's actually even a smaller number than 200 or 300. It's a, a small subgroup among the Tehran Barbies that this um, whole thing emerged out of. So how did it come about that a movement that up to 1850 had been primarily only reacting defensively against attacks upon it, whose leader, the Bab, had never called for uh, an uprising, had never called for a jihad, had never uh, written encouraging his followers to in any way uh, come out in any sort of violence against the um, existing uh, regime. Uh, how is it that this group of people went on two years later to actually make an attempt on the life of the Shah? And in particular, then, we're going to now concentrate on what was happening among the Tehran Barbies. Um, the sources tell us that for the first, roughly for about a six-month period, which, as far as I can tell, was probably the last half of 1850 and probably going into perhaps the first couple of months of 1851, there was a battle for leadership, um, a contest for leadership, between two of the followers of the Bab in Tehran for the Tehran leadership. I'm, I'm not talking about now the whole country. What had happened was the top layer of the Barbie movement had been removed, and so basically the Barbie movement was fragmented into different local groups of Barbies. There was no longer a national leadership. And in Tehran, there was a contest between the lead, for leadership between two individuals. The first was named uh, Sheikh Ali Atol Shizi, who took the name Azim, and the second was a, um, a he was a very much a, um, uh, he was a religious leader, he was a cleric from the northeastern region of Khorasan. He'd always been one of the more militant Barbies. As far as we can gather, he'd tried to organize a rescue of the Barb when the latter was being taken under armed guard past Tehran. This, um, and later on, he had, um, during an episode which was called the Seven Martyrs of Tehran, when seven Barbies had been executed in Tehran in 1850, this whole episode may have been partly caused when certain plans he made that he was hatching were discovered by a government spy, although I'm not myself quite clear whether he actually was hatching this plot or whether it was the government spy making up this plot, because there's a uh, there's not a lot about it in the Barbie sources, so I'm not sure whether the, the plot actually existed or not, but if it did, he was certainly the person who was uh, the leader of the plot in 1850. So anyway, he was one of the more militant figures, let's say. And the other contender for leadership was Said Basira Hendi, a blind Indian who was, uh, by all accounts, a compelling orator uh, and asserted that his writings were inspired by the Barb. 
we understand that he was mixing Hindu beliefs regarding reincarnation together with a claim to be the return of the Imam Hussein. Um, and for six months there was, a, as I say, a competition between these two contesting the leadership of the leader uh, of the Barbies in Tehran. And it appears that Azim must have won since Sayyid Basir then left Tehran for Esfahan and he was later executed in late 1851 in, in south um, west of Iran. Another contender for leadership in Tehran was uh, Mirza Yahya Nuri, who was, had the title of Azal. He had a number of letters from the Bab that appeared to bestow on him a certain degree of leadership but from the accounts that we have, he appears to have deferred to Azim in the leadership of the Tehran Barbies. And although he tried to maintain some independent authority, his youth, he was only about 20 years of age at this time, would have made it impossible for him to assert very much leadership in the presence of a figure like um, Azim, who was very much a senior cleric and, and very respected figure and so on. <coughs> and. Uh, another person who never formally put forward a claim of leadership at that time, at this time, was Mirza Hossein Ali Nuri, who was late, who was at this time known by the title of Baha, and later became, took the title of Baha'u'llah, and became the founder of the Baha'i Faith. At this time, he w did not put forward any claim to leadership, but he was in many ways the organizer, or one of the main organizers of the Tehran group. His home in Tehran was a meeting place for the Barbies and a resident for Baha'i Barbi travelers who were coming through Tehran from other parts of Iran. His wealth financed many of the Barbie activities and supported those Barbies who had been made destitute by the persecutions in other parts of Iran who had, and who had come to Tehran. So there was these four or so people contesting the leadership and Insofar as I can make out what was happening, uh, by the early by early 1851, Tehran Barbies had divided into two camps. On the one side, there were those who um, wanted to continue the struggle, wanted to achieve a military victory in the sort of mold of what was in the Shi'i prophecies, um, uh, in the in the Shi'i traditions. And we can describe them as clinging on to the Shi'i catastrophic type of millennialism. They still believed that uh, there would be some sort of military victory. And this group was led by Azim and had the support of Azal and was meeting at the house of Suleiman Khan, who was a, um, a leading courtier in Tehran, wealthy person, had a large house. His father had been in charge of the king's stables and he himself was in court circles and this group was meeting at his house and the second group who disowned violent action who rather looked to the texts of the Bab that exhorted his followers to high ideals of virtue as a way of attracting people to the new religion and maybe therefore said to be moved, moved over to the progressive type of millennialism and this group was led by Baha'u'llah and met in his house so uh, there were these two camps in Tehran in the early 1850. And the two events that shifted the balance among the Tehran Barbies towards the catastrophic group, I think what I'll do is I'll just put up these names here, because I'm going to keep them going. On this side, there was Hazi. And this, what, the events that happened that shifted the balance away from those on uh, the progressive towards the more catastrophic elements among the Barbies in Tehran was the fact that the Prime Minister of the time uh, exiled Baha'u'llah to Karbala. So in other words, he removed Baha'u'llah from the scene. This happened in June 1851. And Baha'u'llah was in Karbala right through to May uh, 1852. 
So this removal of the leader of this group shifted the balance towards the other group. And the second thing that happened was the arrival in Tehran of another important figure, which was uh, Hussein Jardim. Hussein Jardami Lani was a, um, a figure who had not been a Barbi a long time. He had become a Barbi uh, only for a year before this. Um, and he wasn't an educated man, he was a weaver. But he seems to have been a very compelling, charismatic type of personality. Um, he arrived in Tehran and was initially living in a caravanserai outside the town. But he was introduced to Suleiman Khan who had this large house in Tehran, and Suleiman Khan was very attracted to him and invited him to come to, to um, live in, in his house. And very soon, this very charismatic figure was giving, uh, pre uh, making major speeches and attracting large numbers of people to his house. And um, it was with the coming of at about this time, whether it was directly caused by the coming of Hussein Jan or not, I don't know, but uh, the removal of Baha'u'llah, the coming of Hussein Jan, all of these things seem to have turned people towards militancy, because at this time we uh, hear that uh, Azim and Azal began to talk about accumulating weapons, talk of revenge, and these sort of things started to come to the fore, and Azim wrote to a uh, number of Barbies in other parts of Iran asking them to come to Tehran and assist in these plans. And at the same time, Hussein John was whipping up uh, enthusiasm for all of this by his oratory and by his um, skills in, in sort of uh, uh, with, with uh, rousing the emotions of, 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 of the Barbies collected at Suleiman Khan's house. Um, in Baha'u'llah, as I say, when we come to 1852, Baha'u'llah returned to Tehran in May 1852, but he was unable, and in these crucial three months just before August 1852, he was unable to re-establish his, um, his sort of previous um, authority in, among the Barbies of the town because the prime minister of the time, by this time the previous prime minister Mirza Tari Khan had been dismissed and there was a new prime minister Mirza Agha Khan. Uh, he was a Nuri, he was distantly related to Baha'u'llah and was from the same Nuri clan as Baha'u'llah. And Baha it was he who had brought Baha'u'llah back from Iraq. But he had, he was doing this really for his own reasons. He wanted to show the Shah that he had the Barbi problem under control. And he, and, and one of the ways of doing this was to have Baha'u'llah under his own personal um, uh, control. So he made Baha'u'llah stay in his own house in Tehran. And in the summer, when the summer months arrived and it was customary for the nobility to withdraw to the cooler hills to the north of Tehran, he had Baha'u'llah go to his, um, sorry, he kept Baha'u'llah in his brother's house in Tehran, but he had Baha'u'llah then move to his own estate at Afchen, to the north of Tehran. So Baha'u'llah was kept away from the Barbies and therefore unable really to influence what was happening in these last one or two months before the uh, attempt on the life of the Shah. So what was happening in these meetings that um, uh, were being held in the, in the house of Suleiman Khan? As I say, Hussein Jan was becoming more and more inflammatory in his um, speeches, and it's clear that he had uh, really totally started to dominate this group of people. We're fortunate in having an account of what was happening from the brother of Baha'u'llah, uh, Mirza Musa, who's known as Baghay Kalim. Um, Mirza Musa uh, was, obvious, was really part of this other progressive group. He was against all of the talk of militancy that was going on in Suleiman Khan's house. And on one occasion, just a few days before the attempt of the Shah took attempt on the life of the Shah took place, he went to Suleiman Khan's house and tried to, uh, in an attempt to calm things down and to uh, talk them out of any militant action. And we have an account from him of what happened when he went to the house of Suleiman Khan. 
what happened initially was that he went to the door and the doorman didn't recognize him and turned him away but then the people inside heard what had happened and sent uh, someone to bring him back again so he came back and this is his own words in his own words what happened when he what he found when he went into the meeting he said when we got permission to enter the meeting we saw that Hossein, that's Hossein John and Milani, was not the same Hossein of former days. His first words were an apology, i.e. about the previous fact that he'd been turned away from the door. Then he said, that which the primal point, i.e. the barb, had forbidden, I have permitted. Now, in this group, there were some Qajar princes. There were quite notable people attending this group. There were about 70 people this group of Barbies who were meeting in Suleiman Khan's house, there were Qajar princes, there were members of the nobility and so on. And Akbar Mirza, the, who was one of these minor Qajar nobility, was there. He, uh, Mirza, uh, Mirza Musa reports Akbar Mirza, the brother of Muhammad Hashem Mirza, a minor Qajar nobility, was there and he was going along with them. Then a lengthy poem, which one of the people of Azerbaijan had composed in praise of Hussein, in Persian, Turkish, and Arabic was read to the end in a joyful tone. Every time the name of Hussein was said, everyone prostrated themselves to him. I saw that some were looking at me angrily because I was not going along with them in their obsequiousness to Hussein. One of them seized the turban of uh, Janab, who was this um, uh, Muhammad Hashem Mirza, one of this, this Qajar, who had come along with Mirza Musa to this meeting, one of them seized the tur turban of him and cast it to the ground, saying, How long will you remain behind the veil of names and customs? I saw that this accusation was actually directed at me, so I asked Hossein, Hossein John Milani, The Bab has pro prohibited prostrating oneself before another human being. Do you now enjoin it? This question put Hossein into deep thought. His head fell and he said nothing. As I looked around the gathering, I saw they were all immersed in desires and passions, except for three people who were in a different state. They were disgusted at that worthless assembly and were like prisoners in thought of escape. And he says, one of them was Suleiman Khan, who was standing there distraught, and from time to time an involuntary movement could be seen in his limbs, and he would shift his position. Another was Mirza Ahmad, who's the secretary of the Bab, and who out of embarrassment was standing in a corner, and another was Mirza Abdul Wahab, Wahhab Shirazi, who had followed Baha'u'llah from Iraq to Tehran. And when I saw those people were emotional and tearful, I saw that it would not be right to remain at this meeting. And so through a stratagem, I tried to extricate, I managed to extricate myself and the prince from there. <coughs> so this is a report of what was going on at the meeting just two days before the attempt on the life of the Shah. And it's clear from this that even Suleiman Khan, who was later blamed as, to be, as being the, the chief um, organizer of the attempt on the life of the Shah, even he had lost control of the meeting and everything was being totally dominated by Hossein Jan, who was using his oratory and crowd manipulation skills to excite his audience and exalt his own leadership. Mirza Musa further recounts that he, that um, that uh, this Azim, uh, the following day, actually sought another meeting with Mirza Musa and had told Mirza Musa that he'd actually been chucked out of the meeting, and he when he tried to stop Hossein Jan from proceeding with the with what he was planning. <coughs> so. It's clear that Hossein Jan, who was not a particularly educated literate or anything else, not an organizer at all, in fact, had sort of keyed up everyone's emotions. And what appears to have happened is that he sort of sent out 12 people from this meeting to go to Shemran in the north of Tehran, where the Shah was staying. And of these 12, three then found the opportunity to make an attempt on the life of the Shah, but it was never a particularly, um, how should I say, serious at, uh, attempt, not a well-conceived attempt in that 
Their guns, their pistols were loaded with grape shot, which would be very unlikely to kill anyone. And they, they, so the whole thing was rather badly planned by Hossein Jan, who was more of a sort of orator than a planner by, the, by all indications. And so the whole thing went awry and resulted in complete disaster for the Bani movement. Um, in that the Shah then gave orders for, uh, first of all, two of the, two of the, of the assassins were captured, tortured until they revealed who they were, and then a raid was made on the house of Suleiman Khan, and 12 Barbies were captured there. And the servant of Suleiman Khan was made to then go around Tehran identifying other Barbies who had come to the meetings at Suleiman Khan's house. And these were arrested. And there was a general uh, arresting of any Barbie who could be found anywhere in the country. And uh, orders were put out for a general um, uh, massacre of any Barbies who could be found. So the whole thing ended in disaster for the Barbies. Baha'u'llah himself was imprisoned. Um, he was identified by the sh mother of the Shah as a key Barbie, and therefore she was very keen to have him killed. But he, because uh, he had initially been found in the uh, compound of the Russian minister, the Russian minister. Baha'u'llah as being one of the people who had been at these meetings and so he was uh, eventually released uh, and left uh, exiled. So <clears throat> what I want to do quickly then in the last couple of minutes is to talk a little bit about the factors that led, as I say, from it, the situation in 1850 where the Barbies were basically only reacting to defending themselves when they were being attacked to this episode, what were the factors that led this small group of Barbies in Tehran towards violence um, and towards this attempt on the life of the Shah? First of all, uh, one factor to bear in mind is that it was just a small group, and it always is just a small group. I mean, if we look at these other episodes of violence that I mentioned at the beginning, Om Shin Rico and so on, these were never any of these episodes were not the whole group engaging in violence. It was always a small group uh, within the, the, the following uh, of that particular religious movement who, who go for the violence. Millennialist groups are not strange cults as newspaper articles love to depict them. Neither are they socially marginal nor are they psychologically maladjusted. There are a f number of very s well defined situations in which millennialist groups who would normally be quite peaceful because even the catastrophic um, types of millennialist groups believe that the catastrophe is going to be coming through a non-human agency. They don't consider themselves as being obliged to bring it about in any way. It's going to come and they, uh, they, they will be there and they will witness it. But they don't regard themselves as being the instigators of violence. So. What, what is it that causes these normally peaceful millennialist groups, whether they're of the catastrophic or progressive type, to move towards violence? Those who have studied these uh, have come up with a number of factors. Uh, first of all, they've divide, they say they've divided the, the types of millennialist groups that go on to f violence into three types. And of these, two of the types are relevant to the Barbies. The first is those groups who are assaulted and just have to defend themselves. And that group fits in with the Barbies in the period from 1848 to 1850. They were assaulted, they were attacked, and they defended themselves. So violence in that group is purely a, a reaction uh, against uh, being attacked. But the other group that she identifies, which I think is more relevant to the 1850 to 1852 situation, is that of the fragile group, where the leadership is fragmenting, the goals are slipping away from them, and they want to do something to realize their millennialist goal, whereas previously they'd been content to just let it happen and the understanding that it was going to happen through some external supernatural force coming in and uh, causing things to change, as they see their goals slipping away from them, as they see, in effect, uh, defeat staring them in the face, they start to try and 
uh, themselves bring about this um, millennialist goal they tr uh, and this attempt on the life of the Shah I think can be seen in that way it was a last desperate attempt by a, a small faction of Barbies holding on to their vision of how things should have been that, that the coming of the 12th Imam should have resulted in an apocalyptic battle that should have led to a military victory and so on they, they still had this Shi'i view of how things should be and this was a last desperate attempt by them to realize that vision uh, of what should have happened with the coming of the 12th Imam. The specific factors that we can identify that led these Barbies to violence are persecution which again can be seen in other millennialist groups that have turned to violence. The Branch Davidians in Waco for example became violent when they were persecuted. Aum Shinriko began their violent actions when they were persecuted and being uh, attacked. <coughs> the second factor is the conceptual factor which is this radical, what you might call radical dualism, the seeing the world in terms of evil and good. Uh, this happened for example, looking back to past other examples, the um, Taborite wing of the Hussites in Bohemia began to see themselves as the elect and everyone else as being the damned and so justified violence towards others by this sort of vision of themselves as the forces of good and others as the forces of evil. And as I say, in the, in the case of the Barbies, there was this vision of themselves as the people who were on the side of the Imam and therefore automatically their enemies were the uh, return of the, of the persecutors of the Imam who, who, who um, and, and that fact in itself warranted uh, being violent, being uh, attacking them. The third factor that's been identified in other millennialist groups that have turned to violence is the charismatic leadership that is required to take people across if you like across this gulf when normally people refrain from violence but to sort of carry them over that bridge a, a, a very charismatic leader will, will take people into this area where they would normally not go <coughs> this occurred for example in other examples in, in the case of Aum Shinriko where the leader as it were to, uh, was able to persuade his followers to, to, to move into this phase of violence and in this case Hossein John Amilani appears to have been a very charismatic leader that was able to take people along with him into this violent phase. And the fourth factor that's been um, uh, identified in terms of other groups that have turned to violence and I think can also be seen in the case of the Barbies is the fact that there was a general, uh, Norman Cohn for example, who's described millennialism in the Middle Ages, talks about the social and economic dislocations that were happening in the traditional structures of Europe in the Middle Ages and which then was the milieu out of which militant millennialism emerged and Iran can similarly be seen in the period that we're examining as a society in a period of rapid social change, economic change and dislocation, the traditional society of Iran and particularly its traditional crafts and industries were being assailed by the economic superiority of the West and there was this sort of general sense of economic dislocation and social dislocation going on. So in summary then what I've tried to show is the way in which a small faction of the Barbies, uh, a mere 70 people at the most, turned from the usual Pacific um, stance of millennialism, the, the normal type of millennialism which is uh, quite content to let events unfold towards violence and that these the main factors appear to have been the severe previous persecution of the Barbies that fragmented the group and, and caused them to want to do something to, to uh, radical to, to, to change things around, the doctrinal elements of the um, uh, radical dualism uh, of seeing the world in terms of black and white, of light and dark, of forces of evil and good, um, and the factor of this of a charismatic leader that was able to take the, his followers across this bridge towards violence.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very illuminating uh, lecture. To me, it was uh, it had a few new aspects that I, as far as I uh, know, Qajar history wasn't. Uh, I didn't uh, know this side. I understand this is a new research. <laughs> So it's not something that I didn't read before. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, I mean, I take the right of a chairman uh, to maybe put the first question, but uh, then you have the right to, of course, to uh, ask others. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on the sources? I mean, it, since I didn't encounter this, it very much <laughs> interests me about the sources. That, uh, well, uh, I mean, most of the material is there implicitly. If you look very carefully at Nabil's narrative, for example, you find that this split between the, the more pacific group led by Baha'u'llah and the more militant group led by Azim is there. We find, for example, that when Baha'u'llah came back from Karbala to, uh, and as I say, was being held by the Prime Minister of the time, Mirza Khan, in his own home, and then he was transferred to Afjah. There's a passage in Nabil's narrative saying that as he was being moved, so in other words, roughly um, about, it would be about June 1852, just two months before the attempt took place, he met with Azim, and it says there that he tried to persuade him against the course of action that he was taking, um, clearly indicating that even at that time, two months beforehand, there were plans to, to, to do something or other. Um, and um, <coughs> the um, accounts of, of the struggle between um, Hussein, um, between Azim and uh, the blind Indian Sayyid, Sayyid Basir Hendi is there in, in the new history and in, um, it's there also even in, in Nabil's narrative, it's much clearer, the, the actual contest and so on is clearer in, in Tariq al-Jadid. So, so, I mean, it, there, there's a wide variety of sources that, that, that uh, bring out this whole element. And, and, uh, I, there's also uh, the, the document that I translated and read out was in the, um, uh, the history, Tariq Zuhur al of Fazal al and Irani, what other, and, and then I used, um, um, let's think, what other sources is, are there? Uh, that those are the main sources that I, that I was using. This makes, uh, brings me to, to ask another question. And, uh, um oh, sorry, the, the other sources are, are, are the actual reports in the um, Tehr in the Ruznameh Vagayeh uh, that actually reports the, the episode and reports the interrogation of the, of the people and, and what they said, uh, the Barbies uh, uh, report their interrogation and what they said and so on. Yes, I, I will. Uh, no, 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 it's okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much.